Hello, Welsh Voice Focus. This week it's great to catch up with a Nottingham Forest fan who's a friend of the show and comedian Matt Board. Matt, people often say, how are you? as a bit of a, a box-ticking cursory exercise, but I guess it's ultra-relevant to you as you've been through so much since since the summer with a cancer diagnosis. In fact, I remember, I'll let you come in a second, but, what's the name? but I remember messaging you after hearing on your podcast, you said, oh, I've got terrible sciatica in my back. And I texted you, and you won't remember this, but I said, oh, my wife's had terrible sciatica, uh, use this yoga stuff. Uh, and you know, oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. And then the next thing I read, you've been in hospital for ten weeks. You've had spinal cancer. You, you know, your life's changed. So yeah, you've had a lot going on. So how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Um, you were one of many people that were very kind enough to send me <clears throat> exercises when you know the, the the chance that it was a trap nerve was was there. Obviously, when I had first started getting that sciatica, I would never have guessed that it was caused by a tumor. So if it's one lesson I can pass on to other people is if you are getting really bad pain, don't just deal with it with painkillers, but really push for yourself to to get a scan or an MRI, whatever it is that, that you would need, because I would never have guessed it was cancer. So, um, yeah, when I was told it was cancer, it was obviously a big shock. I was doing the Edinburgh Festival at the time. And then very quickly, I was um, having conversations at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in Stanmore in North London about... Uh, having it surgically removed very quickly you 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 don't know what they're going to tell you you don't know how long if they are going to tell you how long you've got to live or anything like that and then before you know it you're in hospital it's been whipped out um you go through the experience of as you can you know it's a very big operation I have a huge whacking great scar on my back um you just as a patient I think you're just dealing with the physical trauma of it it's almost just like clinging on to a fairground ride or to, to a boat in choppy water that really you're not thinking about a great deal a lot of the time you're just really not even day to day or hour to hour or minute to minute at times and at times during that 10 weeks it was very very difficult but on the whole it was this amazing experience where I just think I'm very lucky to have had cancer to have caught it uh, lucky to have caught cancer early lucky to have come out of it with some physical changes but really compared to what many people experience when they find cancer in their body I feel like I've had a very lucky um, outcome and um, it's just great now to be I was discharged just before Christmas and it's just so cool to be getting back into work and, and doing things and thinking about things other than just am I in pain and and what does my body need has it been like a mental whirlwind for you as much as a physical whirlwind for you? Because I remember um, I sound like a total fraud whenever I say I had cancer. I mean, I did, but I had this very lucky, uh, found it even earlier than you. I had surgery. I lost part of a kidney, no chemo, no long lasting effects. This uh, hoping to get the five year all clear very soon. But going back to, you know, diagnosis and telling family and um like the mental whirlwind it was, I was 36. So just life comes at you fast type thing. Has it been like just that experience of reevaluating everything for you? Or have you been able to take in your stride or has it, or has a lot of it not even hit you yet? Do you think? Yeah, I think maybe it hasn't hit me yet. Although I think when you're in conversations about it with the specialist that's going to operate on you and you don't know what they're going to say next, you do, you are rapidly kind of trying to figure out what is coming next, whether they're going to tell you that, I can't operate or whether you just don't know what they're going to say. So you're starting, then you fear the worst, obviously. So then when it's not the absolute worst, that's a huge relief. Um, not to minimize then what you are then put through. But I, I really, I think it's almost too soon for me to have fully processed it really, but I don't really want to dwell up, you know, I'm, I'm not the type of person to dwell on the, the harder elements of it. I just think it's a really nice feeling to have come out feeling like, um compared to other people it's not been too bad mm. um and that is how i genuinely feel and um I, the 10 weeks i had in in that hospital were, were amongst some of the most wonderful experiences of my life so a lot of it was just so positive even though my, my body was in physical trauma i i you know i was <laughs> in terms of my spirit most of the time i was i was very good you know the, the thing that i struggled most with was um nerve pain which which um, I, I really struggled with in the middle weeks of it where I, I was just in terrible, terrible pain all day long for three weeks. And that that was, at that point, 
it, that was soul crushing really but then that time passes and again it's another good life lesson that whenever you think things are really bad they, they do pass they do and and people may tell you that they do and at the time you, you sort of deep down you know that it will get better but until it does you can't you think well what if i'm the only guy what if i'm the only guy who's left like this forever um and thank god i'm not so it's just it, mainly i just feel a huge sense of relief and um a lot of gratitude towards the people that that operated on me and then that nursed me back to some level of fitness um, we had lots of messages before from people uh, saying, "Oh, give Matt our best as Forest fans." I mean, are you? Um, are you, are you I know you're back in work to some degree on the radio. Are you looking to get back to uh, all your podcasts that you're on, stand up and everything? Um, comedy is that going to be back on the agenda in time as well? Hopefully, yes. I'm I'm I'm, um, I'm recording all my podcasts again, so you know the new episodes of those will be out in the next week or two, and um, that feels great. Stand up is harder because I can't. Um, st <laughs> can't stand up really without without um sticks and, and and can't walk without them. So um, that's still a bit of a way off. Um, I'm good with crutches, but without them, I, it would be terrible. And there's still, you know, even after doing something like this, I'll need to lie down. You know, it's very um intellectually demanding, and, and I can feel that in my mind, I haven't got the same recall that I had before. That I always had quite a my brain could always find the word and could always find what I was trying to say and I, I I feel fuzzy I'm still on a lot of medications I think that's partly the reason but I think just the more I warm up again and get back to things so writing stand up and performing it having to be on stage for an hour and a half unaided and be fluent and and at the top of my game I think may take a bit longer but it, I, I will be back uh, I don't think it will be too long um but yeah just it's any level of work to be back at already just feels it, it, it's not the same as COVID, but it's a similar thing where you weren't doing something for quite a while. Your brain was somewhere entirely different. And then when you're coming back to something, the novelty of it is just so stimulating that it everything feels adrenaline inducing in a nice way. Just going for a lunch or um, seeing a friend, you know, all those things just feel really, really magical. You know, they just feel great. And obviously they're under underlying all those things now is, is the, is the, that feeling that, Oh my God, you know, it, you never know. Had that, had that tumor not pressed on that nerve, and and it just crept up my spine. It could have been in there for years and years and years and years, and God knows what price I would have paid. Maybe they wouldn't have been able to operate. So, um, I've always been a positive person. I've always been an optimist, but I, I, I feel like it's reaffirmed my view that, um, and I know life is difficult for a lot of people, but on the whole, I think life is. You, you have a level of control over your life, um, even not total control in the sense that you've still got to pay bills and you've still got to work and things like that. Although you could jack it all in if you wanted, but I guess you'd have to, you'd pay the price of that in some way. But in each day, in each scenario, you can find on the whole, you can find something positive about it. Um, and maybe that is a way to relate to being a forest fan. I don't know, but um, it feels like there is a parallel there somewhere. I think you're one of the rare people in this podcast called Intellectually Demanding, so I'm kind of grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of Boris, then, um, I mean, uh, were you able to follow for the season much from hospital? Did they offer you um, much uh, emotional encouragement? Results haven't been great this season, but uh, have you been keeping tabs on the season? I remember being in intensive care. I was in intensive care for a week after the operation and was pumped full of all sorts of things. I don't really have too many memories of it i certainly don't remember it being a week long but i remember periodically coming round and um we were following the luton game <laughs> oh, God. i just remember coming around as right luton, yeah as, as luton equalized um hmm. to take it to 2-2 two -two and thinking fuck is life not hard enough as it is now this that felt worse than getting cancer but um it, it forest actually have been amazing Forest as a club have been very, very supportive. And not just on social media, but behind the scenes, just they always, you know, pe people at the club are asking what they can do for me. And and um, obviously people will know that Johnny Owen's involved at the club and he's a very good friend of mine. And Johnny's been amazing and Nick Randall and um, Steve Cooper was fantastic. When he heard that I had cancer, rang me and, and we FaceTimed a lot. And when I was in hospital, would ring me a lot and check in on me. Stuart Pierce was phenomenal. 
Stuart Pearce rang me before I had surgery, gave me phenomenal advice, came to visit me in hospital multiple times. And people at the club, um, individuals have been fantastic, including players, Joe Warren and Ryan Yates messaged me. And they're people that I'd sort of periodically met over the years. But, you know, when people get in touch with you in, in, a, in a moment like that, you're very grateful for it. And um, I really felt, and of course, a lot of fans did as well, really felt like um, that Forest as a community was was really wishing me well. And, and I'll forever be grateful for that. Um, what advice did Pierce give? Don't mind, we could pass it on. Pierce, actually, so I thought he would give me advice about um, effectively physical rehabilitation, and I mm. thought, oh, maybe it was about the time he played on with a broken leg or when Basil Bowley nutted him. But he gave me really good advice about how to use the time. I didn't necessarily take that advice, but he was saying you're going to have a lot of time on your hands in there, and it's up to you how you use it. In fact, oh God, I just remembered. So he he told me that um, when he was a manager, that he decided to read the 100 classics, 100 as they were ranked, top 100 novels ever written. And they said he got caught reading Treasure Island in the dugout at Palace Away. And I, and I thought, <laughs> he's right. I could read a load of books that I've never read. He said, oh, you could learn a language. I was like, this is a really good way of going in and not just thinking of myself as a patient, but thinking that, of course, the day will be taken up with a lot of hospital things. And, and for, the, for the initial acute phase I might not have the um, ability to to read or the, or the wherewithal, but I will have a bit of time and I can choose to use that as constructively as possible. So actually, it, I thought I might not be able to read, but I'll get an Audible account so I can download audio books. So even when I'm physically spent, and the problem was I'd, I'd been cut open at the front and the back, so I could only lie on my side for six mm. of the 10 weeks that was in there and teams of nurses would have to come in and turn me every four hours. So my posture wasn't such that I could read a book and I wasn't allowed to lean up because of this huge wound on my back. So I thought I'll download Audible and he'd mentioned Treasure Island. So I thought, well, that's a sign. I'm going to listen to Treasure Island. I don't know if it was just because I was in intensive care. It scared the shit out of me. I was just like, <laughs> it was giving me nightmares. I was like, I can't, I can't, no one told me. I thought this was just about some guy who went to find some treasure on an island. I didn't realise it was a terrifying tale of pirates. It was absolutely petrifying. In fact, I had to stop because I was convinced it was actually causing me physical pain. So um, <laughs> I, I, I paused um, listening to Treasure Island, but I've, I've resolved that when I um, feel confident enough, I, I will take it back up. But he also gave me some really astute advice about how social circles work and about how some friends may feel a bit awkward. So if you don't hear from some people, it's not that they're not thinking of you, it's that they don't know the right thing to say and not to judge people for that and um, sometimes to reach out to them. So he, he, he's, he, as you would imagine, he's an exceptionally wise individual. And uh, I, I just thought those bits of advice were really, really helpful and really positive. And he just a very, very funny man. And, and, you know, you can't believe, as a Forest fan, that as he was at the time, Steve Cooper, that the manager was reaching out so often and spending so much time talking to me and that, Certainly for me and for many Forest fans, our greatest ever player, you know, maybe, you know, just in terms of an icon, it is, is then going out of the way. And then on top of that, people at the club, people like Johnny, people like Nick, and um, so many fans were, were taking time out of their day to, to message and to wish you well. And I think I, t I took genuine strength from that. Uh, whenever anyone's going through, I mean, that would be another lesson is if you know someone who's going through anything, big or small, and you think, oh, should I message them or not? Message them. Just message them. They might not reply, but I think when you're going through something and people get in touch with you and just say, I'm thinking of you and I'm wishing you well, I would take some level of strength from that. I mean, I don't believe in God anymore, but when people would tell me they were praying for me, I, I took something from it. Just knowing that anyone out there is wishing you well on any level when you're going through the most difficult period of your life really does do something it's just a little it's just a little pick me up it is just like a little flutter of something that you feel so um you know to everyone who listens to this podcast who got in touch with me and uh, or message me on twitter or whatever thank you very much um has your outlook changed at all on forest in terms of i mean football essentially it doesn't pay the bills it should be a bit of fun but it gets way more much more than that i mean it's not meaningless because of like the mental aspect of it. I'm a big believer in 
Um, but have you changed how you view Forest and how you support them now based on your experience or not? I'm just as obsessed as I ever was. Um, I, I mean, I've always believed that um, football is more than just a game in the sense of what it means to people and what it what it does. But also just for escapism, there's nothing like it. You're mm. watching an entirely improvised hour and a half's worth of sport. And it could go either, you know, it's just, it's magic. So w- watching football in hospital, watching um, not just Forest, but any game was just great. Super Sundays were just the, the best days in there. My from friends would come and watch them with me and it was, you know, that's two games and you think, right, for a Sunday, in a way you feel less pain because, you know, the, the periods when I was in there, I was on a lot of painkillers, but at times they really couldn't give you much more unless they were going to put you back in intensive care. And you do have to sometimes try and do what you can with breathing exercises and some level of like mind fullness i mean it, it's deeply despairing to be told that but anything that took you out of it or or just distracted you for a bit really helped and obviously in football unless someone gets injured you know you're in having surgery on bone and then someone breaks their leg then maybe that might just take you back in there but on the whole actually there you're completely elsewhere for an hour and a half so two games on a sunday just like well that those days were, were especially um important and they are, you know, it's it, to people who love it. And it, it, it is, <laughs> I mean, I think I could genuinely make the case that every Sunday I was in less pain as, res, as a result of it. So um, football football has the huge potential to do good and not just where football clubs do a lot of good in the community and, and everything else, but it, something that engrosses you. And that would be true for music as well as books and films and everything else. But, yeah, I think there's nothing like football because – a good game of football when it's completely engrossing and you know that this hasn't been written is uh, is something very special. Um, have you got back into your FPL team? Because I remember when I was in hospital for a couple of, uh, I think it was only a couple of days, and I was listening to you talk about do something important, do something useful. I started an FPL team and then I've become way too obsessed with it. And obviously you had the podcast and had to drop the FPL aspect of it. But are you yeah. back into it now? Now you've had the time on your hands? I was doing really well before I went in. And then for the first bit I was really good at it and then and then when I had those middle weeks where I was just in agony I couldn't really interact yeah. with anything so um I fell away but now that I'm back into it so I tumbled down the leagues but now I'm back in and now that I'm being more um attentive I'm 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 climbing up again <laughs> uh look out John Richardson so yeah. you mentioned Cooper a couple of times I know you you like loved him as a manager as a bloke because so many of us did so he, when he went, how did you feel? Did you feel like it was the right time for him to move on or were you just absolutely gutted by, by it and all the stuff that he'd achieved was now, you know, a chapter in the past for the club or not? I think it was really difficult because, I mean, half the chance at the ground were about Cooper. You, you, yeah. you must have thought, like, what are we going to sing now? You know, um, not that I was able to go, of course, but I've, it was just gutting, wasn't it? I think it was just gutting for everyone. I can't imagine anyone really was happy about it even people who thought it was time no good really you know it was just it was just <sighs> you want any forest manager to succeed obviously but given what he'd done and given the way in which he'd done it and the way that he'd been with us as fans as a collective she wanted him to succeed more than anyone else since psycho had been at the club so i think it was very very difficult but football's I think what's amazing is you can look back on that and and obviously it was rapid. Equally, other managers might have been sacked before he was. And you think about the time the previous year. And then, in a way, what's quite nice is life does move on. And that's like an important lesson for us all is, um, obviously, I was in a position where I was really, for, for a moment at time, I'd really had to think about life and whether mine was going to be shorter or a lot shorter than I thought it was going to be. And I, rather than finding sadness in the fact that things go on, I find a real um, strength in it. I think it's nice to know that stuff goes on stuff, you know, and for better or for worse, um, you move on to the next phase and that's difficult for all involved, but you, you do move on. And, and um, I think Nuno um you know, particularly the, the Newcastle and the Man United game, then the West Ham game, you think, 
Oh man, I'm already starting to do my head in because I'm like, I was just about to say, I think we'll definitely stay up. And then you're like, why are you <laughs> going to torture? You know, it's just so difficult because no one knows what's going to happen with any punishment for for the financial side of things. And then I just keep thinking, I mean, this is the problem is that I guess every fan goes through this, but with Taiwo, Ilanga, Hudson Adoy, Morgan Gibbs White, you've got effectively a front four that are lethal. And none of the teams around us have anything like that. Um, whether that makes whether that actually counts come the end, I don't know. But I feel very optimistic about Forest. I feel very positive about us. And you think it's not. And then you think of like Marillo and Danilo, and you just think if we'd have had a really good goalkeeper from the start of the mm. season, I think it would have been very different. Um, mm. So now I'm going to do that really dumb thing of going, not just do I think we'll stay up, but I'm already thinking we might get mid-table next season. I'm already starting to overreach again. But how can you not? How can you not get excited about those four? They're phenomenal. Um, so as worried as I am and as nerve-wracking as it is, and it's horrible to be back in this situation again, um, I still think there's a lot to be positive about. Yeah. They're probably the last two games have summed it up. Like... I remember the title for our podcast after the Newcastle one was our forest going down basically because they keep making the same mistakes. And after being West Ham, it's oh, can they push on because they've just won a game? And you kind of veer from those extremities. But yeah, we do have a good team and the numbers back it up. We discussed this on a recent episode, but like if we had a better keeper, then we'd be higher in the league. We'd have conceded. Definitely. I think between them, they've conceded 10 more goals than they should have without getting too down on Ricardo Moss and Turner. But yeah, there's definitely the makings of a, a good team there. Um, I mean, last time, we, we haven't been on this season. So of the signings that have come in since last summer, which ones have you kind of uh, immediately fallen in love with and will be absolutely devastated should they leave? I think Alanga's class. Murillo. Hudson Adoy. I mean, obviously everyone remembers Hudson Adoy being talked about as like the saviour of England at one point. So then when he, whatever went on at Chelsea and elsewhere, he always thought, well, he can't have just lost that talent. So when he came to us and just seeing the way that he's grown game by game is, is, is I'm just so, obviously I'm happy that he's done it in a forest ship. I'm really happy for him because it just goes to show that in life you can um, be, maybe, maybe you're just not the right fit in a particular place or a particular manager doesn't like you or whatever. It doesn't mean that you can't then still go on and have success or, or, or do something with your life. So it's just great. He just looks so happy to be at Forest and playing the way he's playing. Alanga, I just think, is phenomenal. And, and and obviously, when we saw Brennan, you think, oh, who's going to give us that level of pace? And now you see him giving it to us. And, and I think you could argue he offers us a bit more than Brennan offered us. So he's great. Murillo is just absolutely sensational. Absolutely fantastic. So I think... I'd say Alanga and, and Murillo and, and Hudson Odoi are the three that I really of the, of the newer ones that that um, that are already like already Forest legends. Yeah, Murillo could be. I think he's amazing. He's got the Des Walker thing about him and a totally different player, but you just don't beat him one on one. And he's just reading no. of the play. It's just ridiculous. Um, just let me take a second to uh, thank our sponsors because. Uh, I need sponsors to make this work, basically. Yeah. So um, thanks very much to Trent Navigation. This is uh, Wednesday pop. night. I don't what need to say anymore. Man. Yeah. And not just um, great beers, but immaculate inside. Cobs on the bar. What more do you want? I, th I would say it was well-priced as well. And then, obviously, as you know, the big shed outside and what they've done on match days is phenomenal. That's become... When I first started, going, you know, as a kid... I never really heard of the Trent Nav as like a, a big place to go. And then the last few years, it's really grown in stature as a pre, pre-match place to go. I love it. And I love the fact that it's on the way to the ground. And I just love everything they've done with it. It's great. I think I'll just clip that up and play it into a few Fair episodes enough. now. I'm sorry week. if I interrupted your ad read. No, it's <laughs> better than mine. God, I do some terrible ad reads on this. I did one recently <laughs> with Dar Darren Fletcher was on and he was just laughing at me because... I just made, made a terrible hash of it. But, you know, live radio, you know this, live radio, live podcasting. That's right. It's all out there. Yeah, it, it can is. all go wrong, certainly. Yeah, true. Right, I don't need to do any, any more promotion for the now for this episode because Matt's done better than I definitely could have done. Um, 
Are you worried by the spectre of relegation at all then? Because I know like um, you're great to make with John Richardson and he's probably t- saying to you, oh, I'm loving this season because we're winning and there's new, no VAR and all the nonsense that goes yeah. with that. But really, I don't even know the championship exists. I've said this before. No, it's like the Premier League is everything. And if we go down, it'll be different. But yeah, the, spe- the spectre of relegation terrifies me still, partly for the financial aspect of doing this but from the football aspect of well as well how are you fe- feeling about it are you not 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 too bothered or do you think we're you know still in big trouble we're in trouble i just can't figure out i just I, what i think sheffield united and burnley are gone hmm. god knows what happens with points with everton and everything and with us that is obviously chaotic but if i look around i mean obviously everton until they got the points deduction we're doing all right so you have to slightly feel for them, really. Um, I think we're better than the teams around us. I really do. And I think we've got more. And obviously, Tywo was out for so long. Um, so now that he's back and he's scoring goals again, I kind of think, I, deep down, I think we'll be all right. I think we'd only go down if we got a points deduction. Yeah. And depending, uh, depending on then, depending on how many it was, I mean, you can't see it being 10 if it's just a one-year infringement. So, uh, yeah. I think if we don't get a points deduction, we're definitely safe. Oh, why? Am I How many it? points? Uh, we've discussed this on the podcast a lot. How many points could we uh, take the hit and still be fine? <sighs> oh. The problem is, it's so, the, the, the kind of unintended consequence, it's not just the effect on us, is it? It's the effect on everyone else. It's mm. teams going. Actually, we could stay up now. You know, if that gives Burnley or Sheffield United something to fight for, then it's a disaster. So I think three, three or four, and you might be all right. But I think I'm only saying that because I heard Steve Hodge say it. Mm. Uh, and I'm like, is that my opinion or did I just hear Steve Hodge say it? <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, I, I think any deduction and it's a lot harder, obviously. Yeah. But I, I think a deduction would be like, I don't know. And I, I, it's all the other stuff that goes along with it, isn't it? it? It's then what it would do to like the mindset of people and and the confidence and and all all those things. I'm worried, but I'm not too worried. I I, I do think we're better than the teams around us. And I think all of the things. I'm torturing myself now because actually, I think we'll stay up, and that's my final yeah. position. I am starting to come to like love and hate Luton. Because I think Sheffield United and Burnley are gone, but they just won't go away, Luton. I know. Like you, ostensibly, your players aren't really good enough, but you're fight, they're fighting for every ball, and they've got enough good players like Ross Barkley, like his like player transformed. I was yeah. like, I think, think let's just, just start losing every game, and maybe they will now. I don't know, but yeah, they're a bit of a pain in the ass, aren't they? Oh, definitely. Because you're watching Luton, Man United. No one. Like in a right mind, would rather Man United beat Luton, apart from Man United mm. fans. You know, the whole country, the whole world's wanting Luton to win that, including you sort of forget which side you're rooting for sometimes when Luton are playing because getting to the Premier League is incredible for them and, and they're doing everything they can to stay there. How can you not be enamoured by that? How can you not be somehow taken in by it? If it wasn't our expense, I'd want them to stay up. Mm. Um, but it may well be, so fuck them. Yeah, I think they might. I mean, like, yeah, I look at like Palace still and Brentford and Everton. There's, yeah, I think there's other teams around. There's maybe Luton can stay up and we can stay up. I'm not sure. Um, That'd be nice. What do you make of What do you make of Nuno in terms as a manager and as a, a and a, an impressionist? Could you do a Nuno? Do you think? Do you know what? I've not thought about who I could impersonate for so long that I've got. <laughs> it can't be that hard, can it? But. Um, uh... I mean, I think you have to say, like, we look good. Yeah. We look positive and up for it. So if there's such a thing as Nuno Ball, yeah, uh, I enjoy watching it. We we look like we're up for the fight. We look we look like we're not just going to um, be easy to beat. You know, you, you compare it with, obviously, the 5 nil away at Fulham is one of the worst Forest performances we've ever seen. Mm. That is, like, rock bottom, really, probably since the League One times or since the last game of the season in the Championship a few years ago when we missed out on goal difference when it all fell to pieces. Um, 
compared to that, it's fantastic. But obviously, the way we played against Wolves soon after was was a much better. So we were getting better performances under Cooper. But um, I think the way the way he's got us playing football is brilliant. So that gives me a lot of confidence as well. And I think um, a lot flows from the manager, and and he seems to be a very impressive person. Hmm. When you look back at that Fulham game, it shows how there's always a way back for a player, I think. Because there were a few players there I thought, oh, if they don't play in a Forest shirt again, I'm not fussed. Because they, I thought they downed tools. But then you look at, you know, how um, well, Dominguez was one. I think he's done great. Olerain has done great. Um, Sangare got hooked at half time as well. And we haven't really seen the best of him, I guess. But... Um, yeah, do you, does, does that game show that, you know, no matter how badly it goes, there is always a way back for players if they knuckle down? Yeah, and obviously, like, players are human beings. Mm. And like, the, the, it was all like a shared... Co- you know, Cooper was there at the end sort of taking the blame you felt and, and apologising, but really it was good for the players to apologise as well, really. And, and in any workplace, there'll be people who are more motivated or less motivated. You know, there are some people that clearly, after a period of time, are less motivated by what being a footballer brings depending on who's in charge or whatever and sometimes having a new manager with a different way of doing things suits players and it's sometimes it's just a bit of a reminder of what who pays their wages and what the hell's going on um so yeah i think there's always a way back for people um definitely um as as livid as sometimes we get watching them (laughs) but in a way that's more annoying because you're like well if you can do it now why don't you do it then but then you never know you know the one thing that um i was doing this sort of job and listening to a lot of football podcasts you'll often hear stories from players going oh you know i just found out my dad had died or my mum was ill or whatever and you think we sort of presume that they've got nothing else going on in their lives or that because they get a good wage that those things shouldn't affect them that's madness these are young people and pressure gets to them things going on at home get to them. It's not just about who the manager is. There are other pressures on those people's existences that we often don't know about. So I think sometimes as well as fans, um, we just need to slightly be more, like not, you pay your money and if the team aren't putting in a good enough performance, you're entitled to your opinion. Obviously, we've all been livid with Forest players and teams at, at various points in the past. But now I definitely think, I'm more inclined to think, as as annoyed as I'll get inside the stadium or watching on telly, I always try and think, there might be other stuff going on here. They're still human beings, and I don't know the reason behind sometimes someone's... You know, you only need to look at that interview with Deli Alley and and, and um, when everyone was wondering what had happened to his form and the reasons behind that. You think, well, um, we don't know what are going on with... what well, are often young men, miles away from home, got very international squad... Um, it, it wouldn't be unusual. You know, if you'd said, look, there's this 20-year-old kid and he's from one side of the planet, he gets plonked on the other side where the weather's terrible compared to this lovely climate he'd been used to. Um, do you think it would take him a long time to adjust in any line of work? You'd say yes. Um, and yet in footballers, we're like, you've got to be brilliant now and all the time, otherwise you're a terrible person. You think, well, despite, the, you know, obviously the money that they're paid is sort of often is um, justification for the outrage. And sometimes players are lazy and, and rubbish and they don't try as hard and that, that's infuriating. But I think sometimes that, or at least maybe I'm being too charitable, I sometimes think there might be other stuff going on. I'm going to try and chill out a bit. No, I think you're right. I think like I sit here six days a week and talk about it and sometimes you don't appreciate, like, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche about confidence, but Calvin Wilson was on here. I asked you about that Fulham game and he said he thought it was mostly confidence. Lewis said the same, Lewis McGugan. And Michael Dawson was on here and he said, oh, there was a stage in my career where I couldn't pass the ball five yards without thinking it was going to go awry. And I guess we forget that. I mean, uh, I guess, have you ever had that in your career? You know, stand up, you're testing out jokes the first time they bomb and you think, oh, I can't do this. I'm, you know, that that, that, that uh, imposter syndrome where you think like, I don't belong at doing this. Have you ever had that, I guess? I never really had imposter syndrome. And and I guess what's different about comedy is obviously when you first start, it's a bit harder because you're trying to figure it all out. Mm. With sports, um, obviously, players come in and out of form in a way that comedians tend not to. Is that, You know, you tend to figure it out. And then obviously, your const- routines might get better, but they, they very rarely get worse. 
<laughs> you very start off with it. You very rarely start off with an idea that gets worse each time you do it because you just stop doing it. You know, it's just, you know, you're constantly on a, on a, on a way of like improving things. So I've, I, I can't really relate to it in that way, but I think what you can relate to is confidence at work in other places or, or in friendships or in relationships, or I've worked on shows where um, certainly, you know, stand up is an individual pursuit. So that's different. It's more when you've worked on TV shows where it's like there's there's a number of you writing and obviously you want to be getting as much, if not more stuff in a show each week than, than other people you, you, because you're justifying your place on, or you feel that that's the way to justify your place. So I can identify with it from that point of view of you certainly need, I think, in life to be feeling the results of things or, or seeing the results of things in order to gain confidence and then it becomes self-fulfilling is you get more confidence and then you are better at it and that makes you more confident and so on but if you go through a period where you feel like I'm not getting stuff on or in football in a sense you know not scoring goals or you can't pass it because the crowd are on your back or whatever um I can relate to that in a very very small way but obviously I don't have every time you Write a joke in a writer's room. There aren't thirty thousand people booing or, or <laughs> yeah. cheering or, or cheering. That's true. Like you step up to read a joke out, and everyone goes, "Oh, I'm not this guy." <laughs> oh, I'm that does happen Poor sometimes, on. but yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, you haven't been to a game in person for a long time. I mean, I assume you probably missed that. Are you hoping to get back next season? Maybe is that not something you've been able to think about yet? Um, I'd like to think. Uh, I'm hoping I can get to a game this season, but I'm just not rushing anything. Mm. Um, I have missed it. You know, I see videos, and, and when you're on, te- you know, you watch it on telly. There's nothing like being there. There just isn't. Um, so, for all the years that I've lo- not lived in Nottingham, I've or, uh, there's no substitute for being there all the time. You just, you just more part of it. You, you just. The thrill of live sport when you're there is just fantastic, and and being at the forest ground and it feels like home, doesn't it? Like your emotional attachment it isn't just to the club, but to to the place, and specifically that that part of Nottingham and the feeling you get when you walk over Lady Bay Bridge or Trent Bridge. The, the you know when you hear Mullican Tyre or whatever it is when you night games under the lights and all things like that. That's such a big part of it. It's not just oh did we win or did we lose. It's was I there for me? So I've got, I've kind of had to get used to um, not being there most of the time. And then obviously in the last, <laughs> as you say, whole season, being physically unable to be there. Um, so then you, you, when you're from afar, you know, especially I think if you're going through difficult times, it, it really, um, you cling on to it, you cling on to Forest. You know, you, you, you want them, you know, if you're going through something difficult, like, like I've been through and then, <laughs> Forest of rubbish on top of that, you know. Oh man! Whereas any win, any goal was just the most euphoric feeling, just the, the most wonderful relief from it all. To get out, you know, to be to be discharged from hospital, and then I think it was like the Newcastle game a few days later. It was just great. It was absolutely mm. great. It was just such a. I think I've even been on the day. I can't remember anyway, like my sort of, my memory of chronology is slightly messy, but my God, it still means just as much. I just would always, always rather be there. Hmm. It is mad what a win does for you. Like even, um, well, more people listen to this when we win. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll spend, oh, that's fascinating. I'll spend all week, like I'll actually watch match of the day if we win. I must confess, I don't really watch it if we, if we lose. Oh, I'll fast forward our game. And I'll watch um, that match day pass they do on the YouTube channel, the official one where they show the players celebrating afterwards yeah. and the fans celebrating. Like the psychological, um, I guess it dopamine or whatever, that boost that it gives you is mad just for a win in the Premier League compared to the Championship. But the Premier, any Premier League win, it just feels like an event to me. I don't know if you feel the same. Oh, the same. But I still watch it if we lose because I'm just so desperate to see as much footage of the game as I can. Um so I, I still watch it if we lose, but um, I'm just desperate to see as much as possible because I can't be there. Um, but yeah, win. Oh, you're right. In the Premier League, especially given where we are in the Premier League, that that three points is um, can just you know, especially if you can get a couple of wins together, can just hoist you out of trouble. Um, mm. Because obviously, a lot of the time you, you kind of have to grit your teeth and accept a point. At best, and that's you think. Oh, this can't carry on like this. 
Um, so a win is just mania, isn't it? And that's when you start to get ahead of yourself. But that's the mm. that's just the joy of being a football fan. There is a certain level of delusion that you you have to entertain and and you have to let yourself get ahead of yourself. And football allows you to do that because you can't do that in your own life. You can't go week to week thinking either you're the greatest or you're the worst thing alive. That you know that's a recipe for total mental collapse. But you can you can do that through football, and it's socially acceptable. True. Before we started recording, I was watching a video with, a, I think, an NFL player saying about if you're an athlete, if you the life of an athlete is if you win, you put my hand right, you're up here. If you lose, you're down here, and it's not a healthy way to live. Well, the average person's life is like just like that kind of ocean, but for sportsmen, it's like way too high. And I think for fans, we do adapt to that a bit, like especially seeing the West Ham game, the noise and the atmosphere back in the crowd and that sense of jeopardy, and it feels like. For the first time, it feels like this this season's going back to last season a little bit. And I'd just love it if we could kick on from here and beat Villa. It'd be amazing. And then Liverpool are next. Oh, and then the, the, I'm turning into you because I know this is what I you're know, doing. I know like... you're starting to go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. kind of what it feels like we've got back a little bit is at home. Although the Newcastle game the other week, obviously. But um, it's been a bit more mixed this season, hasn't it? With mm. where our points have come from. But... Keeping the city ground is a really difficult place to come to. So then you do look at that Liverpool game, which is obviously mad given where we are in the league and where they are and what they might potentially achieve this year. Are we nutters for thinking, oh, I beat my home last year. You know, uh, why not this year? And I, I don't think we are. I don't think we are the way things are. And that's that's one of the great things about football is we should have no right to beat Liverpool this season at this stage of it, given where we both are. But you wouldn't, you know. No. Would anyone Johnson be stupid out. enough to write us off? <laughs> paraphrase exactly. A bit. Exactly. Well, Jota's out. Salah's a doubt, I was reading. You know, you know they'll, they'll be coming off a Carabao Cup final. Of yeah. course, if we get tanked 5-0 by Aston Villa on Saturday, then I won't be feeling the same way. But as we sit here right now, I can... Uh, I can make a case, certainly. Uh, the clock's ticking down. I know you've got to go shortly. Anything you want to plug now you're, now you're back on the work treadmill to an extent that anything people should be checking you out at now? Um, I mean, my podcasts are back up and running. Um, I'm back on British Scandal in a few weeks and um, I've started doing the political party again, my political podcast. And John and I, John Richardson and I do a podcast called Down the Dog, which is set in a fictional pub called The Dog and Bastard, which actually is a real pub inside his house. Um, but it's, you know, two mates down the pub and the audience come and join us for for um, a drink of, uh, you know, it can be non-alcoholic, whatever it is. And um, obviously that was something I hadn't done for a long time. And he's, uh, you know, it's my best friend. So to be back doing stuff with him is a really nice feeling. And um, yeah, just doing podcasts. In due course, I'll, I'll be returning to, to other things and I'll be flogging tickets and whatnot. But for now, it's quite nice to not be not really have anything to plug um yeah. just to be just to be thinking about forest and oh, i think we'll stay up i really really do i really think we'll stay up um we have to believe that and not just because uh, anyone has to think that of their team but given the way we play and the way we look and the other teams around us you think no we yeah. will i mean have you seen the stats um it was on Monday Night Football, but it was actually on our podcast before about how since Nuno came in, we've got the third best defence in the league from open play. And um, the, the obviously the front four scoring goals, there's no front four down the league or front three to match our attacking options, I don't think. Luka Everton, Palace, when Eze and Elise are fit are good, but they just can't stay fit. And then Burnley and Sheffield United and Luton don't really have that, that quality. So... I mean, it goes back to our problem all season. If we can just defend free kicks and corners into our box, then we'll be much better. If Matt Sells is a steady <laughs> 7 out of 10 and not what, you know, uh, God love Matt Turner. He seems a good guy, so I'm not going to bury him. But if he performs to a higher level than Matt Turner of Lacodem, I said, I think we'll be absolutely, absolutely fine, I'm sure. So, yeah, it's, I don't think it's misplaced optimism. It's just can the players defend set pieces, basically. I know it sounds stupid, but... Surely they can. Yeah, they did it against uh, West Ham. That was a great performance. Yeah, didn't give away free kicks. Didn't give away corners. You know, go to Villa. I love a draw. Villa are really good. 
and yeah, and then it's Liverpool, and then it's Brighton, who are you know they're a real mixed bag. Let's say again, that's winnable, isn't it? Brighton. Yeah, don't do any Mason Holgate tackles. And, you know, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Man, um, what was he think anyway? Yes. Um, is there one thing that did piss me off actually? I'm not sure you covered it to death on it at the time. But the fact that every pundit thought it was a great laugh what Ivan Tony did. No. Oh. Yeah. It's cheated. Like, it's oh, funny because well, we are... clever. You think, oh, I can't live in a world like this sometimes. Well, that, since I do this with more people now from when I worked at the Post, it was a bit of a split. So the the pros, uh, the ex pros were, and the cynics amongst us were like, well, any Forest player would have done it. And then the others like Greg and Emily were like, that's cheating. You can't do that. So it depends which, which hat you have, I guess. But also, but, I don't like it when any player, you know, this whole, I know people have a love of what they call shithousery. Yeah. I'm not a massive fan of it when anyone does it. I, it, it winding people up, I, I don't, not that I'm some like total purist, but I think I, if you went to school with people like that, they do your head in. Mm. You want to work with someone like that. Don't encourage it in football. Less shithousery, I say. Just, you know, more, more greenhousery. Let's just, <laughs> um, you know, let's have players. <laughs> Growing sustainable food for us all to eat. Yes, that, that sounds shit. like the uh, something that could be tested in a focus group by a political party. I think <laughs> no, Greg Mitchell will be delighted that you're back. Uh, he's a Patreon member of your podcast with John Richardson, the Down the Dog. Oh, man. Be very pleased. That I pub's real you. then, because I watched Meet the Richardsons um, and you were on it. I don't know if you enjoyed acting or not, but it, it, it blurs the lines between reality and um, comedy, you know, fiction. But that pub's real, then, is it? The pub's real. So, like their 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 property in in um, the show is not their real home or anything like that. Ah, uh, okay. Um, but at their previous house, like it was the old garage, he fully turned that into a pub. It was incredible. And in their um, their, where they live now, um, he's got like a basically a huge back room that is now turned into the dog. It's got like a proper bar and like. You know, those whiskey mirrors on the wall. The, the attention to detail is phenomenal. He's got old pub tables and old um, ashtrays, dartboard, pub carpet. It's magic. Mm. It's so cool. He's, he's built basically a massive den, you know. Like even the way the telly's on the wall is like it would be in a pub. It's great. Um, and sometimes he's in there when he records it. So it's a fully immersive experience. But Greg is um, – I just love seeing him at Forest Matches. Such a love. I mean, obviously, you're all a lovely bunch, but um, he's always very kind about the podcast that I make and stuff. So, hopefully, if I can make it to a game this season, I'll I'll see him or indeed you there. Hopefully, so. Hopefully, so. He would love that. I would love that. Uh, talking of Greg, so he's back on. Is he back tomorrow? No, he's back on Monday. Uh, post uh, Villa tomorrow, 10 a.m. Myself, Temps, Emily previewing the Villa game, then Villa post match. Uh, oh, on Friday as well, uh, interviewing a guy called Ian Finch, who's a Forest fan, who is a producer for the BBC, who uh, produces all the big outside broadcasts for sports and BT. And he does he works on Match of the Day, so we can finally find out about running orders and how the show works and why Forest fans, obviously Forest fans, you know, uh, hate things being left out. So we can pick Ian's brain on that. So do join us for that. Uh, and as ever, if you've uh, enjoyed this video, do us a favour, hit like, hit subscribe. You can consider being a, a channel member as well and give us a good review on uh, iTunes. I do read them all, so it's all very much appreciated if they're five-star reviews. So, yes, there you go. Just about to cover the video there. Matt, uh, it's been great to have you on. I'm glad to see you're doing well. And um, it's quite inspiring, you know, how you, uh, in, uh, you know, tough times and coming out the other side and it's good to hear the message that you're conveying to people around well get checked first of all and you know reach out to people and uh forest is going to stay up that's good as well yeah yeah and um you know it, the other thing i would say if it's all right is you know as a result of my surgery i've now got a colostomy bag for life I've got a stoma and, and I have to catheterize myself in order to piss. And, and, and prior to the surgery, there were things I was really, really worried about, really troubled by, um, actually disgusted by. 
particularly the thought of having a stoma and having a bag, they're both totally fine. There were things that I really didn't need to worry about at all. And, I, and um, you know, if I think sometimes people might put off going to the doctors or whatever, fear of what might happen, or they might... It's not just about whether people specifically might end up with a costume bag or something, but I think, you know, it's often the prospect of things is far worse than the reality. I think once you've actually been through something and um, experienced it, it's usually never as bad. Um, but yeah, I think if there's something wrong with you, whether it's a persistent cough or, or pain or just anything unusual, no one knows your body like you, it is push for whatever scan or test it is you might actually need because it's far better to be a bit of a pushy patient and then you go well at least i got good news out of it because if it is something bad there's no point you, things don't just get better if it's mm. something serious find it find it early and, and deal with it as soon as you can and you do come out the other side i realize that i'm very lucky you know some people come out far worse than i but you know those people have chosen to go through that because they've chosen to live um, and they've chosen that course of action because it's for them it's the most rational choice, and I, I've certainly felt that way. So, um, you know, there, there can be scary things in life, but actually, you, you know, you can't live your life in fear, and you can't shy away from taking important decisions for your own health or, or for your own life that would, um, you know, be against your self interest because you're slightly worried about things. It's good to it's good to go through those things and learn from them. And um, yeah, if people have you know listening to this may face the prospect of a colostomy bag you know people with crohn's or um ulcerative i can never say the word colitis whatever it is you know mm. it, it, um it, it's just to say to people and i would have loved to have heard from someone in my position who was having it um basically because of the cancer surgery that i required actually it's fine it really is so um hopefully if there's even just one person listening that uh, that is in that position then i've uh, i've given them what I needed to hear before I was uh, chopped open. No, you're dead right. You're dead right. I mean, I, I know I keep saying it's like it's a fraud, but my thing was found when it was stage two, and it, if I'd left it and it goes to stage four, and then you have a very different prognosis. So, yeah, uh, Matt's absolutely right, certainly. And, yeah, echo what he says. He says it's far better than me. And, yeah, listen to Matt's advice. You're an inspirational guy. Well done. Well done. Oh, mate. And um, I guess if there's one extra thing I could add, it's that you should leave a five-star written review while sitting in the Trent Nav and join one of their wonderful ham cobs. Excellent. Yeah, uh, I've, I've got to let you go because I know you've got a thing, but it was a funny thing at our live show talking of home cobs when Bertels was on the panel. And I said, I'll buy you dinner, anything you want. Uh, and I said, do you want curry? Do you want peach? Or, no, I'll have two cheese and onion cobs and a glass of Chardonnay. <laughs> What a legend. Uh, what a legend, I know. He'd had a pizza the whole night before. So that was nice. <laughs> right, a good note to end on. Do join us tomorrow yes, at 10 a.m. if you can. Right, yes, thanks very much, Matt. Do hope to have you on again soon. In the meantime, everyone, have a good day, and we shall catch you later. Good. <laughs>